And it's now time for questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And I call Mr David McNary. And could I inform members that question six has been withdrawn? Speaker, question one. Mr Speaker, there are a number of mechanisms by which future demand for health and social care services is predicted. A demographic model is used to predict the likely growth in demand for services over time, as well as the costs associated with this. This model is based on current population estimates, national population projections and current demand for health and social care services. The model considers a range of service areas, including acute care, elderly care, primary health and community care and general medical services. In addition to this demo demography model, regular analysis of the demand for a number of specific services is undertaken to identify any gaps in the capacity available to meet this demand and deliver required performance standards. In assessing future demand, the pre predicted prevalence of diseases such as heart disease, diabetes and cancer is considered, drawing on the findings of national audits and regional and national publications. The development of new technologies has an impact on future demand and mechanisms are in place to ensure that UK and international developments, emerging research, new technologies and specialist drugs are considered when planning services. Mr. For a supplement. Uh, as we break for the, the recess with no questions, and that means no answers until September, I thank the Minister for his uh, uh, detail there. Uh, he talked of demands. Would he outline the department's policies uh, for future GP services and the availability of uh, new life-saving drugs? I think there's, there's two different, very different questions related, and I'll do my best to, to address as, mo as much of both of them as I can in the time that's available to me, which has only just started, I noticed, from the clock. Um, in respect of, of GP services, I, I'm well aware, and having um, spoken with uh, local GPs even in our own constituency, uh, of the demands upon their services, there has been a significant increase in the number of people presenting them to GP practices over the last number of years. And I accept and, and acknowledge that there has been uh, difficulties pursuant to that in, in, in terms of our GPs and the work that they do. Um, to that end, my, my predecessor announced the £15 million investment in GP services this year, including uh, some targeted resources at trying to recruit more GPs. Um, and a significant portion of that investment was to allow our GPs to modernise and expand their practices as well. Um, so I look forward to uh, our GPs who, who correspond through their various organisations, various trade unions with me on a regular basis. Uh, I hope that they will take up that funding that is there to expand and to modernise their practices. Uh, in respect of uh, the issue of particularly around, around uh, I think he was talking about uh, drugs and new drugs. Uh, the member will be, will be well aware of the, the financial pressures uh, that my department uh, faces uh, and, um, and the difficulties that uh, the, the pressures that are around 35, 40 million pounds that currently exist uh, in the department um, and how that, that situation is not being helped. I heard the finance minister uh, in our final question talk about welfare reform, how the fact that we are losing uh, nine and a half million pounds a month in terms of penalties to, to pay for welfare reform is not helping my or indeed any uh, executive minister with their budgets. Um, there are um, obviously processes that are in place to approve uh, drugs uh, through the National Institute of, of Clinical Excellence. Excellence. A guidance uh, circular was issued in uh, 2013 which requires uh, each, in, um, each new drug to go through technology appraisals and for that to, for the, the board who are the commissioners obviously of new drugs to take account of resource issues whenever they are commissioning those drugs. And that also and includes the not just the cost, but the cost benefit of taking something forward. Thank you. And I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Considering the increase of meningitis W throughout the United Kingdom, what is the Minister doing in relation to managing the risk of the spread of meningitis within Northern Ireland? The member raises a very good issue, and sometimes there are, there are conditions. I talked in, in my original answer about uh, studying say, the prevalence of conditions and diseases like heart disease and cancer care, and, and that, using that to project future need. But there, sometimes there can be uh, other conditions, other diseases that very rapidly, very suddenly come on to um, um, become problems. And, and um, meningitis W is one right across the UK where there has been a sudden, uh, a rapid, indeed a very worrying increase in the numbers of, of cases. 
Um, members uh, will, I'm sure, be aware of the recent announcement that the meningitis B vaccine um, would also would be, and also meningitis W vaccination programme would proceed uh, across England and Wales in uh, September of this year. Uh, there were two reasons up to this point why I haven't been able to make a, a similar announcement. One was I hadn't the funds uh, available to do that, and I also hadn't uh, agreed at that stage of process to deliver our vaccines using our, our GP network and our, our, our trusts to, to do that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to announce to the House that just yesterday I released uh, funding from my budget to pay for both the meningitis B vaccination programme and the meningitis W vaccination programme. Um, I, I've done that in spite of the difficult financial circumstances the budget fa I face within my budget. Uh, I do so, at some, do so at some degree of risk, but I think it is something that I'm sure the whole House and the whole community would uni unite around me and say that it's the right thing for us to do. Uh, that means, therefore, Mr. Speaker, that meningitis B and meningitis W vaccinations will go ahead in Northern Ireland from uh, September uh, of this year, and I'm sure that everyone will welcome that good news. Mr. Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the minister? And considering that the main plank of the 2011 TYC plan was a growing older population with greater need, uh, what formal assessment has been made of that particular need, and what plans have developed as a result? Well, we do have. I mean, the, 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 the member is right to identify the fact that um, it is a an older population that is putting significant pressure on our budget. Now, I always am very, very careful uh, in whenever I'm talking about a, a, an aging population to say that that is a good thing, and it is a, great, it is a great thing that we are living much longer and we are able, because of technological medical advances, to deal with many conditions a lot better than has been in, in the past. Uh, and it's also the case, too, because sometimes I think whenever we talk about the aging, an aging population and its perception as a bit of a burden on the health service, that in most, in most cases, most people are living healthier and happier lives as well. So, you know, it isn't, it isn't a problem, but there is obviously a, a related uh, and has been a related rise in chronic conditions because of that aging population. And it does put significant pressure on our resources. So, you know, for example, by, um, in terms of the predictions that are there, by 20, if you go very, very far out, by 2061, over half of our population is estimated to be 65 plus. Um, even in the short term, uh, between now and, and 2017, it's estimated that there will be an additional £50 million pounds of recurrent pressures on our budget, so over £200 million. Pounds. So there is, it is something that is the, the ageing population and the impact that it has on our budgets is something that is always assessed and is assessed on an ongoing basis. And that's, his, that's precisely why, uh, when you take something like transforming your car, which the member has a very deep interest in, uh, if certainly if his, the number of questions that he asked me about it or anything to go by, is there in place? Um, and, and whilst I, I accept that it hasn't been implemented to the extent that we would all want or at the pace that we would all want, it was always a longer term strategy. It was always something that we were working towards over a, a five year period and it was always going to be very much demanding, de dependent on uh, resources that were going to be available to us. And obviously in the intervening period since the launch of that TYC vision, there has been a, an issue in terms of the availability of resources which has impacted on it, but it doesn't lessen, uh, in my view, the need to continue to pursue TYC and indeed other reforms and transformations of our, of our health and social care system. Uh, can I ask the Minister, if we try and get as many in as possible, will you stick to two minutes? Ali Gieston. Question number two, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can assure uh, the member that no permanent residents at Northfield House residential care home will be forced to leave their home against their wishes. I fully appreciate that this may be a worrying time for residents of statutory residential care homes, and that is why I recently wrote to all residents in the affected homes to provide them with an assurance that they would be able to remain in their homes for as long as their needs can be safely met there. I should stress that no final decisions have yet been made on Northfield or indeed any of the other homes being considered as part of the ongoing regional review of statutory care home provision. The South Eastern Trust's proposals for Northfield House are subject to public consultation, and no decision will be taken pending the outcome of the consultation process. When the South Eastern Trust's proposals are published for consultation later this summer, I would encourage everyone with an interest to make their views known through the consultation process. Good. And I call Mr. Easton for a supplement. Could I thank the Minister for that answer? Um, could I ask the Minister if Northfield House does close, um, what will be the effect on staff? 
It's worth um, pointing out, Mr. Speaker, that there's no um, well, it's earmarked for closure. The trust have obviously said that they, they want to close it and there's a consultation. We will listen to the responses. Or the, 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 the consultation responses will obviously be, be listened to. And as I said before, I would encourage anyone with an interest to make their voice heard through, the, through that consultation process. There is, though, no imminent uh, closure because of that promise that I have given that no existing resident will be moved against their, their wishes so long as their needs can be safely met within their current um, home. Um, it is relevant to, to raise the issue of staffing because whilst we're obviously, I think, rightly focused most on uh, residents within statutory care homes that are earmarked for uh, uh, closure, um, there is obviously an impact on, on staff as well. Uh, and, and we should also bear in mind the impact that, that um, the situation will have on them. Um, my understanding is that there, is currently, there are currently 26 staff uh, working in Northfield, and that is to uh, look after, take care of three uh, permanent residents in Northfield House. And whilst primarily um, staffing issues are a matter for uh, the relevant trust, uh, each trust will have in place uh, redeployment and workforce planning measures in place to ensure that uh, staff um, won't lose their jobs but will be used um, uh, elsewhere as where, where that is needed. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, do you give the same commitment to permanent residents in the Slave Row nursing home in Kilkeel? And just on a more general point, um, specifically with the role of, of statutory um, residential care within the, within the old people's model, could you tell us a wee bit more on it? Sorry. Sorry, I didn't hear, quite hear the end, uh, end of that, but um, the, I can give, yes, I can give this, the same assurance to. Uh, permanent residents in, in Sleeve Row. It's a, it's a blanket uh, guarantee promise across the board to, to all residents. Uh, that's why I, I took the decision to, well, I not only took the decision to uphold uh, the commitment made by predecessors, but I, I wrote to each uh, of the 80 or so residents who are affected by possible closures uh, to make it clear to them all that none of them would be moved against their wishes so long as their needs can be safely met in their current uh, care home. And that's, that stands, and I hope that it, it stands in the future, no matter who is in, in this role. Um, in terms of the general issue around this, I mean, we have to, I think, recognise, uh, and somewhat relates to the, the question asked by his, his uh, colleague to his right, um, that this whole area of care homes, residential care homes, has changed quite dramatically over the last number of years. And I don't mean just in terms of the closure of statutory residential care homes. That is a reflection of a, uh, a reduction in overall demand for places, whether that's in the statutory sector or indeed in the independent sector as well. And that's because of conscious decisions that are being taken by people uh, as they get older to live in their, their own homes and their own home environment for as long as they, they possibly can and so long as their needs can be catered for in their own homes. And I think that's something that we should want to see. I think, I think most of us would want to take that same decision ourselves. Uh, and it's something that certainly the system is trying to encourage, particularly through uh, the implementation of the vision laid out in Transforming Your Care, which is to try to look after the, the, the home as a hub for people uh, and looking after people's needs in the home environment as best as we possibly can. I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Here, um, Minister, the people of North Down don't have too much trust in consultations following recent exercises and indeed guarantees. But surely the, the, the ban on, on new admissions is bound to affect the sustainability of that home. Uh, is that a deliberate policy, Minister? And can you guarantee us that your uh, approval is needed before any closure is initiated? Yeah. Well, I, I don't think I can go any further than making the guarantee and, and writing to each resident, including the, the three uh, permanent residents in Northfield House in Donegadee, and making it clear to them that none of them will be moved against their will uh, so long as their needs can be uh, safely catered for in, in Northfield House. Um, and obviously, you know, the needs of individuals will change over time, and some may want to, to move elsewhere, or their, their, their care needs will, will alter and might be better looked after in a different environment. But so long as they, they want to remain where they are and it's safe to do so, that's where they will be. And that's, that's, that's the guarantee, that's the promise that, that I can give and, and, and sure, and it follows on from what predecessors put in place, and it's what is there. And, and no one will be forced to leave their home, and no pressure will be placed upon anybody to leave their homes. I'm very, very clear on that. I want to make sure that that is absolutely the case. Um, the ban on um, uh, new, new um, admissions is obviously one that has probably flowed more from 
common sense and not um, wanting to, given, given the decisions that are, were pending in terms of, of these care homes, it, wasn't the wise, it wouldn't have been the wisest thing to say and, and had new admissions, only to then take a decision to close and then have the, perhaps potential difficulties arising from that. So, you know, I think it was a, a common sense decision that was taken, but obviously there was, there was 19 homes reviewed. Um, the majority of them will either change or will remain, re change in terms of their use or remain in place. Uh, with admissions opening up for them, and that will help obviously open uh, in many cases, many, many cases, many places across Northern Ireland. Very soon, the doors will be open, and people will be admitted to these homes again. Mr. Conor Murphy. Conor Murphy, can I call a question number three? Question number three. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is anticipated that the paediatric centre of excellence at Dizzy Hill will be complete by August 2017. Mr. Murphy, for the sub. I uh, thank the, the Minister for his response, and it is very encouraging. Uh, as he will know, this is a, a long-standing uh, commitment from the, the Trust, uh, and one which is uh, vital to secure the, the uh, sustainability of Daisy as a, as a hospital. Can he, uh, is he in a position to say whether uh, paediatric trauma services are part of the Paediatric Centre of Excellence, because that in itself uh, will be a very significant asset in terms of a proper centre of excellence? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member, for his question. In fact, I welcome him back to actually talking inside a, a democratic institution for, for a change. Um, the, I'm not, I'm not, um, the information that I have in terms of what services, uh, and he's right, I think it is, this is an important uh, development. It, is, uh, it does assist with the sustainability of, of Daisy Hill Hospital. Uh, it is ensuring that paediatric services in the whole Southern Trust area are linked up, and obviously, what is happening or what is proposed to happen in the Centre of Excellence at Dizzy Hill will link in very clearly with, with what's happening in um, Craig Avon Area Hospital as well. My understanding of what is included in Dizzy Hill is that there will be inpatient uh, services, there will be ambulatory care, and there will be outpatient um, uh, services as well. And, and plus, in, in Dizzy Hill Hospital, unlike in, in Craig Avon, I understand that there will be a dedicated paediatric um, uh, theatre as well in place. And in respect of trauma, that's not the, I don't have the information as well. That's right. I, I, don't, um, I will come back to the member and identify whether that is the case or not. But certainly it is a, it is a good news story for Daisy Hill Hospital and its long-term sustainability, but it's more importantly uh, a good, good story for the Southern Trust area and paediatric services within that trust. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. And I very much welcome uh, what he had to say about the Paediatric Centre of Excellence. But we had a Centre of Excellence for Stroke Services in Daisy Hill Hospital. That has been moved uh, and against uh, the will of the, the people of Newry and the Greater Newry area. Can I ask the Minister? if he will undertake to review that decision with a fresh and open mind. I am aware of the, the issue in terms of the, the removal uh, of some stroke services from, from Daisy Hill Hospital. And this is, I think this is one of the most difficult issues that I deal with in, in, in this job. Not this issue particularly, but this type of, of, of issue, where um, trusts um, and the board will take decisions to move services uh, with the interests of uh, better standards of care for our patients, with patient safety at the forefront of, of their mind, which is something I think we should all agree upon. Sometimes that then brings about decisions where, where services are shifted and reconfigured from where they currently are. And there's obviously um, many long-standing emotional attachments to a service being delivered in a particular area, as well as the convenience of having that service delivered in a particular locality. Um, at all times, those decisions should be taken and will be taken on the basis of improving the standard of care. And I appreciate the concerns that the member and many of his constituency, constituents in the Newry uh, and RMI area will have about uh, moving stroke services away from Daisy Hill, but my understanding is that the proposal um, will bring about greater flexibility in the way the Southern Trust delivers its stroke services and, and will, will mean that there will be improved levels of stroke care in line with national recommendations, so raising standards. Um, that there will be dedicated medical, nursing and allied health professional team within a specialist acute stroke unit. Uh, direct access as well is very important in terms of taking pressures off emergency departments to a specialist award on first admission and also better long-term outcomes. Now, that, that is the objective of the changes that have taken place. I think we would all 
on paper agree that they are good outcomes, but I appreciate that there is that emotional attachment to having a service in a local area. I do though understand, Mr uh, Speaker, that the proposed new model will allow patients from the Newry and Moran area to receive ongoing rehabilitation at Daisy Hill uh, from day 16 under the care of the local, uh, local staff there with stroke expertise uh, and from a specialist stroke rehabilitation team. So there is still a service being retained um, in Daisy Hill, but it is for that rehabilitation phase rather Two than the early stage. Mr. Allegheson, with the usual health warning about constituents, they would have. Um, could I ask the Minister if he could outline the range of uh, major capital projects that he is taking forward? Sir, Mr. Speaker, um, there is um, the capital budget for the department um, for this uh, current financial year is £213 million. Um, and whilst that is, we estimate around sort of £30 million short of what we would ideally like to have. I'm sure we would really ideally like to have a lot more than that, but um, £30 million short of what we, what we absolutely need in the year, and therefore necessitates some difficult decisions around phasing and implementation of various capital projects. Uh, even though it is short of that £30 million, it doesn't mean that we are not able to proceed with some significant capital projects which will benefit service delivery across Northern Ireland. Uh, and they include everything from uh, continuing with the development of a regional children's hospital uh, at the Royal Victoria Hospital, a new critical care building, uh, new maternity facilities at the Royal as well, uh, new primary care centres in uh, Ballymena and Banbridge, and the continued progression of the uh, new um, uh, care centres, primary care centres in Newry and Lisburn as well. Uh, phase B uh, at the Ulster Hospital radiotherapy unit and the redevelopment of Tarbock 5 at uh, Old McGelvin and also on the local hospitals. So there are lots of capital projects that continue to progress um, in this 14-15 financial year in spite of the fact uh, that we are short of ideally what we would like, but then that's the story in, in each and every department. But what we are doing with that £213 million is making the best possible use of it to ensure that the best standard of facilities are provided for people uh, right across Northern Ireland. Thank you. And it comes to Pram McCann. Question 4. Sir, Speaker, with your permission, I respond to questions 4 and 13 together as they deal with core funding provided to voluntary and community organisations. The 67 organisations my department provides core funding support to will receive the same level of grant in 2015-16 as they received last year. Applications have been issued to all organisations and I have asked officials to deal with the first payment promptly once the application is received and all relevant checks have taken place. The voluntary and community sector plays an integral role in delivering care that meets the changing needs of the population here and it is important that it is supported appropriately. That is why my department will consult on proposals to, in the autumn for a new grant scheme to be launched in 2016-17. This new scheme will focus on health and social care innovation and will be open to all voluntary and community organisations to apply. Good. Call the Fran McCann for supplement. And, uh, I thank the Minister for his question and uh, I welcome the decision uh, to continue the, f uh, the funding and I know that there will be a considerable amount of organisations will uh, breathe a sigh of relief. Uh, but could he tell us what will be put in place uh, to continue discussions and consultation uh, with local groups to get, to, to get the, the benefit out of uh, the, the, the extension of funding? Uh, I you, no, thank the, the member for, for his, uh, his comments and his question. Uh, he's right. Uh, it's a decision that has been, uh, since the announcement last week, has been warmly welcomed um, right across the community and voluntary sector, and not least by uh, some, some of the 67 organisations who benefit from what has been described as, as core funding and will continue to benefit for it, from it uh, fully in this financial year, uh, but in diminishing chunks in the following two financial years. Um, I am keen to work with uh, the community and voluntary sector to develop the new fund that I have um, outlined in, in the initial response, which we will consult upon in the autumn. Um, I think it is incredibly important that as we do develop a new replacement scheme, um, which will be open to all community and, and voluntary organisations. I think we need to have uh, particular cognizance of the fact that it was 67 organisations who were receiving this funding. That was by no means uh, the full extent of community and voluntary organisations in Northern Ireland. In fact, there were many who didn't receive. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we work with the entirety of the sector to develop a replacement scheme 
um, which, as I've said and outlined, will be focused upon innovation. I think there's a tremendous amount of innovation within the, the third sector in Northern Ireland, not just in health, but right across the board. That's something that I want to encourage, and I really want to work with that sector to develop a grant scheme which will be progressively put in place over the next number of financial years um, that they can work with and that we get a benefit and we get, and more importantly, society as a, as a whole gets a better outcome from. And it comes to Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to outline what he hopes uh, the new funding scheme will be able to achieve? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Member for, Mr. Speaker, for his question. I think I've indicated um, already that the focus of um, any new scheme will be um, uh, on innovation. Um, and I think that it's encouraging that uh, that proposal and that element of the pro proposal has been well received by uh, community and voluntary sector organisations so far. And as I've said, I I'm keen to sit down and co-design and co-produce what that scheme might look like uh, during the consultation period, which will run in the autumn. Um, the focus will be very much on innovation and, and trying to capitalise and encourage further the uh, innovation which already takes place across the community and voluntary sector in Northern Ireland. Um, one of the reasons and motivations for setting up a fund like this has been, I suppose, from, from experience, it's been my experience in, um, in previous jobs and including this one, that if you want to get, if you want to encourage innovation, if you want to encourage uh, focus on things like early intervention uh, and prevention, and you want to encourage collaboration across the system, you have to have dedicated funds. Everybody, I think, agrees with it in wanting to encourage innovation right across the public sector in Northern Ireland. Um, trying to find the resources from existing budgets to do that can be incredibly complex, incredibly difficult to do, particularly in times like now when we're, we're under severe financial pressure. So ring fencing and having objective, specific funds focused on innovation will obviously produce more innovative ideas uh, and ensure that that um, important element of how we continue to deliver services doesn't fall to the, the, the bottom of the pile. It comes to Pat Ramsey. And I thank the Minister for his response. It is most welcoming and I think along with the Minister, I think he would acknowledge the significant contribution that the community and voluntary sector make across Northern Ireland working with disabilities, those with chronic ill health problems and those acting as carers for those organisations. Could the Minister outline to the House any discussions he has had with NICFA on behalf of the community and voluntary sector to get their buy-in in terms of his new programme he intends bringing forward? I met with um, NICFA about 10 days ago. Um, at that meeting, uh, it was a very useful meeting, um, certainly from my perspective, it was very useful. Uh, we discussed uh, issues that were surrounding the existing scheme and why I didn't feel that the existing scheme could continue in place, uh, why I thought we needed to change. In fact, that, that, that and they accepted, I think that, that point was accepted by them on behalf of, of their member organisations. Um, I think it has been accepted for some time. Uh, certainly has been flagged up and indicated by previous ministers that uh, this core funding scheme, this 4.7 million that was going to these 67 organisations, would be wound down and, and done away with or, or moved to some other platform. Uh, I've taken that decision in the last week to, to move to this new uh, health and social care innovation fund model. Um, and I think that that again has been well received by, by NICFA and indeed other individual organisations, some of whom will be members of NICFA, some of whom will not be. Um, and I, I look forward to working with them and indeed anybody in that sector to develop the new scheme and to make sure that it's in place uh, for the start of the next financial year. You're going to call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I wrote to you at the start of this month requesting an urgent meeting to discuss the plight of the Northern Ireland Attention Deficit and Hyperactivity Disorder Charity. Four weeks later, however, I have not even received an acknowledgement. First of all, could I ask you for an explanation? And then secondly, could you give me a commitment that you will find the 30 minutes necessary to meet with me and the charity to hear about the exceptional work they do throughout Northern Ireland? I feel like I may be sort of being scolded almost by the member there. Um, um, she wasn't alone in writing to me, of course, about ADD, NI, or indeed many other organisations who were affected by, uh, at that stage, no decision in respect of core funding. Uh, many members asked me to meet with them. Uh, I made it clear that I was meeting with uh, NICVA on behalf of the, uh, the voluntary and community sector. Um, I had that meeting. Out of that meeting, a decision was taken. That decision ensures that ADD, NI, and indeed the other 66 organisations receiving core funding will receive 100% uh, of what they would have expected in year. 
uh, and I'm sure that ADDNI and others who have received that money and will receive that money pending successful applications in this year will very much welcome that. And that brings us to the end of the period for listed questions, and we move on to topicals. I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, further to the changes within the Western Trust Community of Meals on Wales service, what is the outcome of the equality screening that was used to test the impact of the changes specifically on older people living within rural areas? Um, I don't know the specifics of what the outcomes of it was. I know that the Western Health and Social Care Trust is currently uh, in the process of taking forward new contracting arrangements for its community meal service and that the Trust has held a number of consultation sessions uh, with clients who receive the service and with service providers. And the feedback from these sessions will help to inform uh, the new contracting arrangements whenever they are, are to be put in place. For, an, for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I welcome the Minister's earlier positive comments about the community voluntary sector. So, can I ask why that we are replacing the current provider of the Males and Wales, um, who is a community voluntary sector group, with potentially a contractor to cut costs? Well, I'm tempted to say you almost answered the question, but um, this, this is a decision ultimately for trusts to take in the circumstances in which they find themselves in. Uh, I know the Western, uh, Western Trust, in particular, amongst our trusts, has been a trust that has been under significant financial pressure over the last number of years and continues to be in this financial year. Uh, and obviously it is a matter for the trust as the best placed person, people rather, to take uh, the decision to decide what is in the best interests of uh, people within their area who need community meals. Um, uh, and obviously they have to take that decision, um, factoring in a range of different issues, including quality and ensuring the quality of the services there. Um, but also of clearly we'll have to have in the current circumstances an eye to what the cost of current contracts and what a replacement contract might be. Now I don't want to get into the, the process going on. Um, uh, the whys and wherefores and judging the merits of a previous contract with something that might replace it. Um, safe as to say that I would want to ensure in any trust area, whether it's a Western, Belfast, South East, wherever it might be, that the highest standard is achieved and that it is done with, uh, always with an eye to ensuring that value for money is achieved. Thank you. I'll call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the recent South Eastern Trust consultation on the future of intermediary care intermediate care. Um, included in that was the preferred option, which included the closure of 20 beds permanently in Bangor Community Hospital, to which 3,000 people objected. Um, given that that preferred option was based on uh, 14 beds at Northfield House, which are now proposed clo for closure, how can that be considered a valid consultation? Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm certainly aware of, uh, or mindful of the point that the, the member makes. It was something that would certainly uh, whenever the decision uh, in respect of uh, Northfield or the preferred option for Northfield was identified by the Trust, I was obviously aware of the fact that, uh, that the option in respect of the closure of the GP referral beds in Bangor Hospital was dependent upon having, I think it was 14 intermediate care beds in Northfield House, and, and, and I obviously, uh, as you would expect, asked the question. I think, in fact, it was the subject of a, an oral question last month from uh, Mr Cree. Uh, and one of the point, one points that I made to Mr. Gray, and of course, again, like the previous question, these are a matter for the trust to decide. Uh, decisions have yet to be taken. If a final, deci if a final decision of the, the trust is to close the referral beds, that will obviously come to me then for a final say so on it, and I will look at all of the evidence uh, that's presented to me. The point I made to Mr. Cray at, at that uh, time, about three, four weeks ago, was that whilst I could see superficially why there might be a connection made, it was a connection that I made in my own mind, the uh, profile of the people who would be in the GP referral beds would be very different from the intermediate care beds that are in Northfield House. So whilst it may look in many respects as the same issue, we are talking about very different types of people, very different types of patients. Dr. Agni, for sub. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Then I come back to my original point because the trust in its, its uh, consultation paper talked about 125 intermediate beds and, and 105 uh, were the Bangor beds permanently closed. Why were they in their, they in their consultation paper treating these beds as like for like? I'm not, sure, I'm not familiar with the, the precise detail of the consultation paper and whether it was a like for like or whether it was a totality that was saying. Um, the, the Trust have communicated their belief that they can um, deal with should Northfield House close and the 14 intermediate care beds. There go there. 
belief is that they can deal with that through um, uh, particularly uh, caring for people, more care for people in their home consistent with um, the vision set out in transforming your care. But certainly if there are any issues around, I mean, this is to say, this is yet to arrive on my desk. And I can assure the member, and more importantly, I can assure uh, people in the North Down and Ards area, this is affected as well, um, that, or sorry, I should say Ards and North Down, just to be strictly correct, and be able to get home safely in the evening. Um, <laughs> See how I just naturally tripped off my tongue. Um, I will assure people in the Ards and North Down area that I will look at the evidence, look at it thoroughly before any final decision is taken. Thank you. And I call Mr. Samuel Gardner. Mr. Speaker, can the minister provide an update on the scale of financial pressures facing the Southern Health and Social Care Trust? I don't have. I don't have the. I can provide the member with a precise figure currently where it is right across. Um, my department, which would include obviously the trusts, um, all of the trusts would include the board's pressures, would include my own department's core pressures, um, would include the likes of the Fire and Rescue Service's pressures um, on our budget somewhere in around 35 to 40 million pounds, which I'm sure the member would agree is not insubstantial. Um, and um, I await the outcome with bated breath of the uh, June monitoring round, um, where I have bids totalling some 89 million pounds submitted. Um, where I hope to, uh, would hope to receive positive action in respect of all of those, but if not, then obviously we'll have to take decisions on the basis of, of what the outcome of that is, because at this stage of the financial year, obviously we need to give some certainty to trusts and others. Thank you. And I'll call Mr Gardner for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the, the Minister uh, for his information thus far. But does the Minister believe that the Southern Trust will be able to deliver its share of the overall £113 million of planned trust cuts without seeing a decline in the safety and quality of care uh, offered to the patients? There are ambitious um, savings targets uh, in place this year of around £160 million. Um, and that adds to the two-thirds of a billion pounds which has been saved uh, over this assembly term already in terms of efficiency savings. And I accept that they are, they are challenging, they continue to be challenging for, for all within the health and social care system. Um, but it is a significant amount of money that has been saved, which has been allowed us then to redeploy back into, into frontline services. Uh, and I expect, and the member is, is right to identify concerns that might be there about where those savings are made from. Um, I want to see frontline services protected as best as they possibly can. I want to see the savings made in areas like administration, uh, in procurement savings, and, and areas like that are not on the front line. Um, I think it's incredibly important that trusts focus their attention on those areas rather than on frontline services. And I appreciate and I accept that it is, a, is an incredibly challenging time for, for all trusts. I have no reason at this point to believe that the Southern Trust will struggle to meet its pressures. Um, and I expect, and it's probably worth making this point, I expect all of our trusts uh, to be at worse than a financial break-even point at the end of the year. Thank you. And I call Mr Oliver McMullen. I can call you. And, uh can I ask the minister? Can the minister give me his views on the uh, chief medical officer's comments that there needs to be a review of our health system? Yeah, I, I um, agree with the comments that the chief medical officer made in his annual report, which was published uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I uh, reiterated th those those points flow from comments of many people who have talked about reconfiguration and reform and transformation of our services. I made similar comments in a speech in the um, Belfast um, Cancer Centre, Northern Ireland Cancer Centre at the Belfast uh, City Hospital, where I outlined uh, not just my vision for a world-class health and social care system in Northern Ireland, but the need allied to that uh, to continue to reform, transform and, of course, reconfigure figure services. And I think the Cancer Centre as a member will be, will be familiar with, is a, is a very, very good example of where, when services are regionalised, um, we can have the highest standard of care, not just in uh, this part of the world, but right across the world. And there's some fantastic work going on there, uh, some fantastic research taking place, some world-leading research taking place in the Cancer Centre. That's the sort of uh, world-class vision that I have for the Health and Social Care Service. I think we can have that right across a number of disciplines, right across a number of specialisms. But it will require a degree of of courage, it will require a degree of political consensus in terms of grappling with the issue of reform that unfortunately hasn't always been in place in the past. 
on Mr McMullen for a supplement. Thank you, and uh, thank the Minister for his, uh, his answer. But well, the Minister, um, w w would you agree that this reform would require some changes to the uh, Commission system? I, I, I do. Um, I think very early on in, in my tenure, I, I, I attended a uh, the second annual regional workshop for integrated care partnerships in Northern Ireland, and, and one of the, the points that um, they made to me uh, that was that they believed that our current current commissioning system was actually a, a barrier to innovation within the system. And whenever I I hear that, and whenever I, I think we all accept that we need to be increasingly innovative in our delivery of public services, not least in the health and social care system. Whenever I hear people who are in integrated care partnerships, obviously made up of people at the primary care level who are at the at the coal face, uh, whenever I hear that, then I get concerned, and I think there's some we need to do something, need to take action to remove that that barrier. Um, the member may be familiar with the, my, my predecessor uh, launched a review of the commissioning process in Northern Ireland. That will be informed by um, a focused review a case study that the OECD, who are doing a public governance review of the whole of the Northern Ireland public sector, their work is particularly focusing on uh, the commissioning system in Northern Ireland. They are going to draw on, they're going to look at ours, examine ours, uh, and assess it and benchmark it against uh, best practice in, in other OECD members. So I absolutely entirely agree that if we are to reform, transform, and make more innovative our overall health and social care system, then commissioning and a, and a proper functioning commissioning system is at the heart of that. Again, comes to Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what actions have been taken to assist the recipients of the Independent Living Fund? The, the um, member raises a very timely um, issue. Um, there was some media coverage uh, over the weekend about the um, doing away with the uh, Independent Living Fund in, in England, which was, comes as a result of a decision taken by the uh, previous uh, coalition government. Um, People in Northern Ireland who are in receipt of independent living fund payments, whose so objective is, of course, to, to keep people with uh, some severe disabilities and severe conditions living in their own home with a degree of support that is paid for. Um, we have taken a decision to continue with the independent living fund. We are working in partnership with our uh, colleagues in the Scottish government uh, to use their, who have taken a similar decision. They are going to take forward the administration of the Independent Living Fund in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, and we continue to work on ensuring that all of that apparatus is in place to ensure that everyone who, who currently receives Independent Living Fund payments continues to do so. I call Mr. Adrian McCullum for supplement. Thank you, the Minister, for your answer there. Minister, could you give me your assessment on uh, the contribution that integrated care partnerships are making to improving health care? I mentioned integrated care partnerships in response to. Mr McMullen's question, um, after having atten attended the, um, the regional workshop recently in, in Lisburn, and it was my first interaction with integrated care partnerships, um, uh, and I knew that they were an, integra uh, an integral part of the vision laid out in transforming your care. Um, and uh, it was useful for me very early on in my term to, to get out and speak to members of uh, various integrated care partnerships and hear a little bit from them about how ICPs have been working over the first uh, few years of operation. Uh, and the message was a, was a positive one. Uh, and I could see very, very clearly, Mr. Speaker, the opportunities presented to the broad health and social care system in Northern Ireland by having integrated care partnerships in place, where people from, from primary care, people from various charities, various, stake, various stakeholder organisations are working together. And they're working together on some very important issues. Um, around um, frailty of elderly people, around diabetes care, for example, uh, and producing new uh, care pathways. And, and there's a lot of, um, lot of really innovative work going on across integrated care partnerships. I think the important and crucial point from here on in, Mr. Speaker, is to ensure that whatever lessons are learned in, in one of the 18 integrated care partnerships, that they are able to be shared right across uh, not just all of the integrated care partnerships, but right across, across the health and social care system. Oh, I don't think we're going to pay for a supplement. Okay. Gurra and and Cash Thagam now. Um, how will the Minister deal with concerns around the draft data processing bill? Uh, and sorry, and will he ensure there will be a clear definition of public interest and social well being included? Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry the, the member missed the um, the debate that we had, the second stage debate that we had yesterday. Uh, it was a very useful debate around uh, various concerns that have been expressed by the committee during its consideration so far of the data, um, control of data uh, bill. Um, 
I'm mindful of concerns around particularly public interest. I'm also mindful of concerns that much of, uh, there, are, there are some uh, data which is already being issued, um, which is not anonymized, uh, which is uh, not done with consent, but is being using a common law process for that information to be shared externally to the system. Uh, I think it concerned me greatly to learn that. I think it's important that we put in place a statutory, a clear statutory framework that would permit, in certain circumstances, with clear safeguards, the sharing of data for medical and social care purposes that are for the benefit of people in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and of course, I will address, seek to address through the, the process in this House and Committee stage the uh, issue around public interest and um, trying to address the concerns that the Committee have to ensure that this important piece of legislation can get onto the, the statute books. Thank you, Minister. And uh, this time is up for uh, questions, and we'll return to the debate. If the House will take its ease while we change the top table.